I became a scientist because of the pleasure of finding things out. This curiosity for discovering how things work. And everybody has this type of curiosity. I mean, who doesn't like to watch detective movies and discover who the criminal is? But if that's the case, why is science only reserved for scientists? Why can't any curious person go somewhere to admire the most recent scientific discoveries, as we do in art, in our museums? The answer is fairly simple. Science is nowadays presented in such a way that we, scientists, can communicate among each other efficiently, clearly, and without confusion. And to present our work to a broader audience, that takes an effort but very, that very few of us are willing to do. That has put us inside a bubble, separated from the rest of society. And I'm convinced that the recent outbursts of pseudoscience and conspiracy theories are just a direct consequence of that detachment that we scientists have accidentally created. But things haven't been always like that. If we look back to our own history, a scientist was not so much different than a craftsman or an artist. Think of Leonardo da Vinci, or maybe not so far back, Ramon y Cajal, uh, my fellow Spanish countryman, a Nobel Prize in medicine for discovering the structure of the neural system. He was actually an excellent painter. And thanks to this artistic talent, he could draw everything that he saw under the microscope and show it to the world. Unfortunately, the gap between science and art has enlarged over the years. But things are changing recently. Nowadays, more and more artists are using such an advanced technology that the pieces of art that they make, they require some tools that are very similar to the tools that we use as scientists. And I believe there is an interesting symbiosis in which both scientists and artists could both mutually benefit. And I'll tell you an example from my own experience. I work in fluid dynamics. This is the science that studies how everything flows. And by everything, I mean everything, from clouds in the sky to the tiniest droplet. And that's precisely what I do. I study how flow develops in tiny droplets as they evaporate. For example, if you put a drop of coffee on your table, um, there will be a flow being generated that takes all those coffee particles to the border of the droplet, making these thick rings that are so characteristic of coffee stains and that you see everywhere. So recently I discovered that if adding tiny amounts of salt to these systems, the whole flow structure changes and you have completely different patterns. So I started to search in for examples in nature of these type of systems, and I found out that actually human tears have the same concentration of salt that the systems that I was using. And I didn't discover that by looking in a scientific publication. I discovered that through the work of an artist called Maurice Meekers and his artistic project, The Imaginarium of Tears. For the last years, Maurice has been collecting tears from friends, from donors, from clients, He's been putting those tears under his microscope, drying them out, and making these beautiful images of dry tears that are authentic pieces of art. So it was a very exciting moment because I could, I could actually explain many of the features in Maurice's work through my own research. And it also gave a completely different dimension to Maurice's work, a completely different way of looking at his, at his pieces of art. But we didn't stop there. Maurice came one day to me and told me, uh, dude, don't you think that every single tear that you see in the gallery is completely different from one another? And then I went, no, buddy. You know, your eyes are fooling you. You know, the, every tear has the same component as each other. You know, trust me, I'm a physicist, right? So of course he didn't trust me. And in the last months, together with my colleague, uh, Sander Hausman, we've been using our expertise in image analysis to measure the complexity on each of these tiers, right? And we do this using something called fractal analysis. What we do basically is to see how the details change at different scales, okay? So what we have found out so far is that every sample that we have studied has a completely different complexity than the rest of them. In other words, Every tear that you shed is completely unique, a unique piece of art, which is a beautiful result, but it proved me wrong. So 
and we still don't understand why that happens and how that happens, so we're still working on that. So, artists and scientists share the same curiosity about the world, and if they work together, they could actually mutually benefit from the very different perspective that they have about nature. And we are currently doing that. We are organizing workshops together. We are having artists in residence in laboratories and just hanging out more often. The idea is to get our work more visible, more accessible. Another Spanish fellow countryman, Pablo Picasso, used to say that every child is born an artist. The problem is how to remain one as we grow up. I like to say it differently. Every child is born with wonder. The problem is how to retain it as we grow up. So I believe that scientists and artists could do a great job to retain and bring back that curiosity and that wonder that we were born with. 